بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Yesterday I spoke to you guys about some literary connections and some things we might learn by drawing a connection between Dhul uh, Qarnayn's story or actually Musa alayhi salam story and the story of the youth of the cave Today we're going to take the next step like I said yesterday um, which is going to be uh, Ashab al-Kahf and some things we can make a possible connection with and draw contrast and comparison with from the story of Dhul Qarnayn um, First thing to note is these are both on the tail ends meaning the first story in the surah is Ashab al-Kahf and the final story in the surah is Dhul Qarnayn so we're comparing the first and the last story so this is something they kind of already have in common is that they are on the ends either ends of the surah uh, this time instead of categorizing things by word connections you know, by literal words that occur again. There's not as much of that in these two, except for a, a couple of them. So instead of breaking that up into different categories, I'm just going to run through a number of comparisons and contrasts, starting with the most glaring one. When you see, you could see the sun when it rises, it bypasses them uh, towards the right, and when it's setting, it cuts across from them towards the west. Uh, or, or so, so the idea there, uh, to, or to the left, the idea there being the sun was mentioned, rising and falling was mentioned, and of course in Dhul Qarnayn's story, hatta ida balagha maghrib al-shams, hatta ida balagha matla al-shams, until he reached the setting of the sun, until he reached the rising of the sun. So the, the the terminology of the sun rising, setting, east, west occur in both stories. It's also interesting that Allah highlighted. In one of them that the, the subjects, the main subjects are still and it's the sun that's doing the moving The sun is doing the, you know, bypassing them And in the other story, the subject of the story, Dhul he's doing the moving towards the east And he's doing the moving towards the west So there's an interesting contrast in the imagery drawn in both uh, surahs On the opening, on the onset of Ashab al Kahf story As they make their way towards the cave, they ask Allah for rahmah so that happens in the opening story in the beginning And in the closing story, at the closing At the end of the story, Dhul Qarnayn declares This is a rahmah from my Rabb Probably an interesting lesson to draw from this Is that the rahmah of Allah is something we should ask for It's there all the time anyway But it's something we should ask for And once it has been given, it's something that should be declared and acknowledged So the the principle of asking for Allah's Rahmah is in Ashab al Kahf story. And the principle of acknowledging that Allah has given a Rahmah, allowed you and I to finish the task that we were supposed to finish, that's how the Rahmah min Rabbi is put at the end. So it's really cool that the opening story has that in the opening and the closing has that in the closing. Moving along, one of the fundamental goals. Of the emergence and the discovery of Ashab al Kahf, Allah wanted people to know that Allah's promise is true. So, one of the culminating purposes of the story was Anna wa'dallahi haqq. Dhul Qarnayn accomplishes his most you know, uh, lauded mission, builds the wall, and when the people are saved that are between the two mountainsides, he says, you know, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي جَعَلَهُ دَكَّا. His closing speech is when Allah's promise comes, this wall will collapse. So this story also culminates with the promise of Allah, meaning Judgment Day, and that story also concludes with the promise of Allah, meaning Judgment Day. It's also interesting that not only is the statement Anna wa'd Allahi haqq in, Surah al in Ashab al Kahf story, the cave peep youth story, that the promise of Allah is true, that statement is reinforced with another statement, which is وَأَنَّ السَّاعَةَ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا That the hour, there can be no doubt in it. That's an additional. So the promise of Allah is true, is already talking about Judgment Day. And then it's reinforced with another declaration, which is وَأَنَّ السَّاعَةَ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا The hour, there's no doubt in it. In Dhul Qarnayn's story, when, my pro when the promise of my Rabb comes, this wall will collapse. He will make it, you know, uh, crushed. But that's not enough. There's a reinforcing statement, just like in the first story, and that is Wakana Wadu Rabbi Haqqa, that the promise of my master has always been true. So the reinforcing the truth of judgment day is done in both stories. It's also actually one thing that I thought about when I was thinking about these comparisons 
is that one of the things that ties this entire surah together is our, our view of the material world. So this world as opposed to the next is actually a constant. Our engagement, because Allah created us a spiritual creature and a material creature. We have this physical material body. We engage in this world. We eat food. We have a family. We make money. We socialize. We engage in the life of this world. And yet our book and our teachings are connecting us to a life that we have not yet known, a life that is coming. Right? So we're constantly trying to find a balance between this life and the next life. And what's remarkable about these two stories, when you think about both of them ending with the promise of Allah, which is the afterlife, if you think about the themes in the story, one of them is about leaving the world behind. Ashab al-Kahf is leaving all material goods behind. They've abandoned dunya, they've abandoned their society, they've abandoned their homes, just because they want to hold on to Allah because of the promise that Allah has given them. On the flip side, you've got Dhul Qarnayn, who is not leaving worldly material goods behind. He's actually making full use of material resources. And yet, even though he's got the material resources in his hand, he's making full use of them, he's still mindful of the promise of Allah when all of these material things will, will disappear. So Allah has to, showed us a remarkable two-side kind of fitna. The, uh, a person could be in a state of fitna where they may have to leave everything they know behind to hold on to the deen. But that, that may not be the case for everyone. You know, we develop sometimes an oversimplistic view of uh, how we're supposed to see ourselves in the life of this world. And we start thinking money or education or career or opportunities. These are all dunya, dunya, dunya. You should concern yourself with deen. You should be like Ashab al-Kahf. Well, the Quran declares that if your life is in danger and if you living by your deen and even saying your shahada, or declaring that Allah is only one, is to the point where your society is ready to kill you, then it's time to head to the mountains. But on the flip side, if Allah has given you resources, He's given you resources, and you're not in persecution for believing what you believe, then you should make every possible use of your resources, and go use the resources to even go further and be of service. And so both of those scenarios have been captured, kind of encapsulating you know, the degrees to which we are supposed to engage or disengage with worldly life between these two stories. And yet in both of those engagements, we, are, we're, we don't become amaterial or materialistic. We use whatever Allah has given us while keeping in mind that the promise of Allah is coming. Judgment day is coming. It's a remarkable balance philosophically that's set between these two stories. Then this is also really interesting the youth declare to their people, talk about their people, they say, Ha'ula These are our people, they've taken a god besides Allah. How come they don't produce any evidence for it? Zulm is mentioned, yeah? Who could be more of a wrongdoer than someone who makes lies up against God himself? Then, as a result of this declaration, they are doing, they, they, how can be how can they do such a terrible lie against Allah? The only choice they had was to flee. In the very next ayah. If you, when you've cut yourself off from them. So now they're faced with people who lie against Allah, who do bulm, and it's a spiritual kind of bulm, right? They're not oppressing, you know, uh, they're, they're not doing crimes against each other, except they're ready to do crimes against them. But they are addressing that bulm, and the way to deal with that bulm is to flee. They have to get away. On the flip side, Dhul Qarnayn comes across a strange nation and Allah gives him the option to deal with these people however he chooses. And he, inspired by Allah's guidance, says, Whoever does wrong, we're going to deal with him. I'm going to punish him. The response to wrongdoing in one story is to flee. And they're still our heroes. And the response to wrongdoing in the other is we're going to bring the wrongdoers to justice and punish them. And that's also an inspired response. What does that tell you? That the believer has options. The, Allah did not give us one situation in life. And in some situations, the right thing, the spiritual thing to do, the commendable thing to do is to flee. And in another situation, the right thing to do is to use the power you have to implement justice and bring criminals to to hold criminals to account. Again, when you develop an over -simpli overly simplistic view of how to deal with evil in society, and you say, well, I don't have the power to put a stop to it, 
I need to do something. If we can't get the power we need to, to bring justice about, we need to take whatever matters in our hand. This is not the Qur'an's way of thinking. The Qur'an is dynamic in its approach to how to deal with different circumstances. And both of them have been applauded. Both of them are situations the Ummah will find itself in different scenarios, in, in different times of fitna, subhanAllah. Then, of course, this is actually kind of historical. From the narrations we get about this surah, what we learn is that the Prophet ﷺ was being quizzed. They were trying to put the Prophet in a corner by asking him questions. They were pretty confident he wouldn't know the answer to. Right? And if he did know the answer, it's, it seems to me, if he did know the answer, the intention was that even the answer would get him into trouble. Theologically, why? Because if he says, for example, Dhul Qarnayn, he talks about Dhul Qarnayn, and he ends up saying Dhul Qarnayn is Alexander, or he ends up saying Dhul Qarnayn is whichever ruler. What was known about these rulers were they had several pagan beliefs, they had committed all kinds of atrocities, they had fairly promiscuous lives. So if the, if the Qur'an will acknowledge these individuals, then the Qur'an will have acknowledged their behavior. That would be a problem. On the flip side, there's the Ashab you know, the, the al Kahf, the, the, the people of the cave, who were lauded and celebrated as saints in Jacobite Christianity. So if the Quran accepts them and acknowledges them, in a sense, it's acknowledging the Christian creed that was being reinforced by their emergence because they were used to reinforce Christian doctrine. Their story was used. And so both of them were, in a sense, you can call it trick questions. So if you, if you answer those questions, then your own beliefs become, you know, uh, subject to question. And Allah addressed both of those asked questions on the tail ends of the story. By the way, the surah has four stories, but the two middle stories, which is Musa alayhi salam's story that we, we compared uh, yesterday, and the story of the two gardeners, were not asked about. Were not asked about. In fact, nobody asked about them. In fact, in the entire Jewish tradition, there's nothing about the story of Musa and Khadir even though there's you know, four of the five books of the Bible dedicated to his career, right? So even, the, even then, so they're unasked for stories. And the two asked about stories are on the two tail ends. Uh, it's also interesting that Allah first, you know, he put the focus on Ashab al-Kahf on the Prophet. Am hasibta an Ashab al-Kahf wa raqim Because the Qur'an's audience actually is two. It's the messenger and the people. And the, the first story, the primary audience of that story was made Rasulullah himself, sallallahu alayhi wa That's what you find in that story. Am hasibta an ashab al-kahfi wa raqim wa tara shamsa idha tala'at. You will see the sun when it rises and falls. Law it tala'ata alayhim, law alayta minhum firaran. If you were to stumble upon them, you would run from them. You would flee from them. Who is it talking to? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa At the end of that story, wa la taqoolanna li shay'in. All singular. Don't debate about them in this. Don't you, in the singular form, don't you dare say you will do this and this tomorrow. All of it is in the singular form because the primary addressee of that is Rasulullah. On the flip side, Allah acknowledges that there are those who are asking you. So the, 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 the primary audience, Rasulullah, the secondary audience also, the people that are coming and asking him questions, and they've been acknowledged in the story of Al Qarnain. You would think counterintuitively because the Prophet's being asked by these people that you would expect yes alunaka in the first story. You would ask, you would Allah would acknowledge in the story of Ashab al Kahf, you would say, they ask you about Ashab al Kahf. But that doesn't happen. Because Allah Allah wants the focus of the Prophet to be on the story for his own benefit, not to respond to them. They've been made irrelevant. And by the way, they ask you about Dhul-Qadir. Dhul-Qadir, by the way, would have been a bigger controversy. And as you've seen, if you've been following our sessions that I'm releasing on Bayna TV, the historical account of Dhul-Qarnayn and trying to reconcile what the Qur'an is saying with whatever historical figure this could be is a huge challenge in Qur'anic studies and in the historicity of the Qur'an. It's a big, big challenge. And the Qur'an deliberately, deliberately makes this ambiguous, which is another point I'm going to make pretty soon. Now... Uh, on again, the notion of fleeing and, and empowerment. If awal fitiyatu ila al kahf, the young people are seeking refuge, heading into a cave. And by contrast, so basically, the way to think about that is they have nothing. They have no place to go. They have no place to even sleep. 
they don't even have any food with them because when they wake up, they're like, hey, whatever money we can muster up, there's a couple of coins, go get something to eat. So they don't have no long-term plan. In terms, if you were to think of them as, you know, somebody who has a home, somebody who has savings, somebody who has a nest egg, these people have stability, right? If somebody doesn't even have enough money to what they're going to do tomorrow, they have an unstable life, right? So they're in, a, in an extreme state of instability and displacement. So they're displaced to the point where they're going into a cave. And by contrast, what does Allah show us in the very beginning of Dhul Qarnayn's story? Inna makkanna lahu fil ardi. That we gave him stability in the land. We, we gave him, you know, firmness in the land. And we furnished him with all kinds of resources. وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا And so the, the, the youth of the cave are fleeing, they're traveling with nothing. And Dhul Qarnayn is traveling with all kinds of resources and putting and pursuing even further resources. فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا The exact opposite. Again, this comes back to the idea of how we see ourselves in the material world. There are situations where a believer will be left with absolutely nothing of this dunya. And there will be situations where a believer will have every part of every power, every, you know, he has manpower, he has physical resources, he has know-how, he's been given all kinds of resources, and he can go in any direction he wants. He's going to go all over the place. Maghrib al-shams, matla' al-shams, bayna al-saddayn. He's going all over the world. On the flip side, they've got nowhere to go but a cave, right? So sometimes Allah will test a believer by restricting their options, by depriving them of worldly resources, and amenities and luxuries. And on the other hand, sometimes Allah might test you and me by giving us a lot and a lot of resources. And so that contrast once again emerges between the two stories. Uh, then, it, from an imagery point of view, it's interesting that Allah highlighted that the young people of the cave were inside of a cave and the sun could never touch them. Right? The sun never it bypassed them. And on the flip side, so that's that's in the ayah wa tarashams idha talaat tazawaru an kafihim that al yamin. Okay. On the flip side, Dhul Qarnayn comes across a people, Lam Najallahum in Duniha Sitra. Right? When he when he got to a people where the sun rises, he saw that these people have no cover from the sun. So the, the Ashabul Kahf are making no effort to be in the shade, and Allah is providing it for them. And these are an entire people, despite all of the, the people the manpower they have, they can't seem to find any shade for themselves they can't find any 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 cover from the sun for themselves and this is again a remarkable contrast that those who have resources even they can become incapable and those who don't have resources allah can provide them shade when he wants to right those they have their numbers and they still can't do anything subhanallah now this is about historicity itself that same nation that Allah says they couldn't find any shelter from the sun makes you think that's weird. How couldn't they? How come they couldn't just build a hut, or build some kind of canopy or something to cover themselves? What what kind of strange people are these? Who are these people historically? Well, Allah says about them, "Kadalika wa qad ahatna bima ladehi khubra." That's how they were. You can come in. It's fine. That that's how they were, and we have full news of who what they really were about. We have we have the full historical account. That's Allah's way of saying you may never be able to find who these people were, and Allah will dis, Allah decided to keep that confidential. Like there's no one that's ever going to know that knowledge is with us. What he had in front of him, the, the people that he encountered in front of him, Allah has full news. You're not going to know. Okay. Now let's contrast that. The story of the cave, the young, the youth of the cave. Um, yeah, situate yourselves where you can see the screen comfortably. I kind of have, it's small sized, so, inshallah. So, when it comes to the, the story of the cave, there is a story circulating. They are known. They are rather famous, even up maybe a little over a century before the Prophet ﷺ. They were pretty famously known in the region. And their story was circulating in Aramaic and Greek. Among the Christians, the story of the people of the cave was rather known. But Allah comes and reclaims it and says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ We're going to tell their story with truth. In other words, the story that is circulating is full of lies and fantasy, and Allah is going to set the record straight. What Allah has done here by this contrast, it seems, one of the things we can learn from it, is Allah is teaching us something about our approach to history. 
there are events in history and the version of those events that we have are highly fictionalized. They've been altered from what they really were. So um, a story has been turned into an epic, you know, like I, I'm reminded of the times where ancient kings, like especially even the pharaohs, they were big on propaganda. You may have known something about how the ancient Egyptians used to record hieroglyphics, right? The uh, art on walls. That was their way of recording their history. And part of their history would be this king who had the power of a god when he swung his sword one time, a hundred soldiers before him or a thousand soldiers before him died. This was to, and this was a historical account, like their version of a museum, right? Why are they doing that? Because they want to reinforce the idea that these kings have godlike power, don't mess with them, right? So, and history was financed. People that want to make ends meet don't become historians. By the way, even today, if somebody becomes a historian, they don't really have a good salary, right? It pays peanuts. But the idea is, back in the day, why would somebody become a historian? They were commissioned by the king. They were commissioned by the empire to record this battle or that, that, you know, that conquest or this construction. And if they're being financed by the government to record this, clearly the government's going to double check and say, how did you make me look? Did I look good in this? You understand? So there's going to be propaganda mixed in with the historical record. That's what is going to happen. And because a lot of uh, kingdoms of the past were closely associated with religious leadership. It's, a, it's an important study for Muslims to understand the relationship between politics and religion and history. Political leadership in many civilizations had a very close relationship with religious leadership. Why? Because people fear the government, but love the religious leader, right? So if you want the, if you want the people to now have a, 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 an awe of the government, of the king, then you, you basically solicit the services of the religious leadership and you get them under your wing. So when they give their sermon or they speak at the temple or they speak at the churches, they make the king look good and they make the king's cause sound holy. And they, they speak of the king as the one that has been chosen, that is divinely ordained and all of these things. And what does that do? It now mixes religion and politics for the population. And that way, the king gets to do what he wants to get done. And what does he do in return? He pays pretty good sums of money to religious leadership. So the religious leadership in different religions in the world was a very high class, pay, very, very well paid, very elite, very respected denomination of society. This is why when Islam or a religion that challenges this corrupt marriage between you know, uh, you know, indoctrinated religion and politics, when Islam comes and speaks about justice, speaks about wrongdoing, who's being challenged? The king is being challenged. And the religious institutions are being challenged. So prophets made two kinds of enemies all in one shot. Two kinds of enemies in one go, right? Now, I'm, I'm, I digress, but the point that I want to make is the story of the people of the cave, what really happened, Allah told us, these young men decided they're not going to worship any false god. And they got in real trouble for it. And they escaped and they had nowhere to go but the mountains. And then later they, they were discovered. And Allah says this, their discovery, the purpose of it was so people would know that there is only one God. And, you know, uh, And part of their recorded speech in the Quran is, you know, um, this, this nation of ours, they call on other gods besides Allah. We're not going to call any gods besides Him. If we did, we'd be saying something absurd. We'd be saying something absurd. So they stood by the truth. And the truth gets them in trouble with the religious elite. And it gets them in trouble with the political elite. And that's why after their discovery, even after their discovery, the, the, the denomination, the, the, the official religion was already Christianity. So their discovery, even though they're talking about Tawheed, had to be converted into something that reinforces the Christian creed. And that's what was done. That's why churches were made in their name. And Allah comes, if Allah did not reveal their story to this day, imagine if Surah Al-Kahf wasn't there, the story wasn't there. To this day, they would be like, you know, how we have Saint Nicholas and Saint this one and Saint that one. There will be these saints. And they would just be saints of Christianity. We wouldn't even know that they weren't you know, propagators of Christianity at all. 
We, we, had no, we had no idea. So what Allah is telling us is sometimes He breaks the historical propaganda record and He sets it straight by way of revelation on the one hand. And this humbles us to think maybe a lot of what we think we know we don't. A lot of what we've, what, what's been passed down in history, maybe we should take it with a grain of salt. We should be a little more critical before we just take, read something and say, ah, this is exactly what happened. What were its sources? What were the motivations for what the, when this was put together? Under whose watch was this put together? Who financed this historical study? By the way, isn't this an important consideration in research also nowadays? Like if there's research on anything, isn't it important to know who funded the research? Right? And who's, who's in control of this research? And were there findings that go against this research that were suppressed? Because it wasn't going against, it was going against the interest of those who were funding it or those who were controlling it. There are many professors across different fields in the sciences and history and politics, you name it, that issue a paper or issue an article and they lose their professorship, they lose their tenure because of what they're saying, right? So the, the Quran is giving us a critical eye of how, how to look at things analytically and not just be sheep. On the other hand, Allah is also telling us there's a lot of history you will never know because Allah didn't want it known. There's just no way for you to know. All you have is conjecture. So for example, Dhul Qadnain comes across the people, they can't even cover themselves from the sun. Who are these people? Where is this place? Why can't they cover themselves from the sun? What's so hard about just digging a hole? What, what's going on here? That's how they were and what he had to encounter, we have full news of. In other words, that's above your pay grade. It's not just the knowledge of the unseen that Allah has kept from us, right? It's not just the, the day of judgment or the number of angels in this room right now. We don't know any of that stuff, right? But there's also knowledge of this world's history that Allah decided to keep hidden sometimes. And we're humbled to that in these two stories. Okay. Now, as a side note, but still an interesting one, both of these stories happen to have a financial transaction. So the young men gathered some money and said, go get us, go buy some food. Here's the money of yours. Take it and head to the city to find some good pure food. It's also uh, two things I'll make. I'll combine two points here. One, there's a transaction to be made, which never happens, right? It never happens. And where are they supposed to go make that transaction? In a city, into the city. Okay. On the flip side, the Qarnayn ends up in a place between two mountain passes. Balagabayna Saddayn. And he finds people there. Uh, actually, no, in the first case. Hatta idha balaga maghrib ashamsi wajadaha taghrubu fi aynin hami'atin. His first venture is to a place that has muddy water. The Qarnayn's first venture is in, towards a place that has muddy water. What does muddy water tell you? It tells you it's no good for fishing. It also tells you it's no good for setting up a harbor. It's no good for setting up a civilization. This is an uncharted location. And yet he discovers that there are some people there. He was surprised to find a, an actual people there. And he doesn't know how to deal with them. So what are we learning in between the lines in the story of Al-Qarnayn? He's going to unmapped places in the world. He's not going to cities. He's going between mountain passes. He's going as far as the west can take him. He's going as far as the east can take him. He's meeting people. Like I said, the second group he met couldn't even cover themselves from the sun. The third group he met could barely speak. What does that tell you? He's going into the uncivilized world, if you will. He's going to the uncharted parts of the world. There's a direct contrast between this and the Ashab al-Kahf who are going where back? To the city. Right towards the city. And Allah is describing subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have resources. When you lack resources, of course, the only place you can go is for to the city for food. You're not going to just head towards east and I'll hopefully I'll find a tree to eat from. You're going to go where the where the resources are. But when you have the resources, you're going to go where nobody's gone before. You're going to go where there are no resources and see what you might discover and who might you be able to help. That might be in need of help. That's the story of Dhul Qarnayn. And that's a mindset for a believer. When, we're in a, when we ourselves, like the world, when we're in a lack of resources, then we go to where there are resources. That's why people migrate, leave the village, and go to move to the city. But when Muslims become resourceful, let me give your example. Any of you, you 
you know, your, your family may have migrated to the United States, to Australia, to Canada, wherever. They had lack of resources where they were, and then they came to where there are more resources. Now you were taking advantage of those resources and you were able to get an education, get a high paying career, all of it, right? Now you're in Al Madina, in a sense. So you're kind of like in the local name type situation, you have resources at your disposal. Now what becomes incumbent on you and on me is to go to places that are not served, to go and take the resources we have and now be of service in places that aren't getting services and go there and help. This is the, the two-fold scenario that's been captured between these two stories. Uh, another really interesting uh, kind of uh, storytelling feature that emerges in both of these stories is that, of course, the, the young people of the cave are asleep for we don't know how long. Uh, there's two ways of read, reading the ayah. وَلَبِثُوا فِي كَحْفِهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةٍ سِنِينَ وَزْدَادُوا تِسْعَى That they, they stayed in their cave 300 years and then they were added by nine. There's two ways to read that. One is that Allah is actually saying 309 some years. Another way of reading that is people said, like Ibn Abbas's opinion, people said that they stayed 300 and even nine, 309 years. Meaning people got obsessed with how many years did they live there or were they sleeping. As if how many there were isn't the point. How many years were they sleeping also isn't the point. You're missing the point, right? But the idea still is, it's long enough that culture has changed, the official religion of the state has changed. Obviously, when the government and the king changes, the coin, the minted coin changes, currency changes, right? Uh, my dad actually has, he had, because he traveled quite a bit of the world, he had a hobby of collecting coins and currency from different parts of the world, right? And I was just going through his collection the other day, and there are literally, you know, coins from like Libya, and from like Iraq, Iraqi currency with Saddam Hussein on it, and Libyan currency with, you know, like uh, people that we've seen deposed and killed, right? And now the only record left of them, of that trace, is their old currency, museum stuff, right? But the point I'm making is currency changes, culture changes, diet changes, of course, clothing changes. Clothing changes. If somebody's dressed like they were in the 1800s and they showed up today, we'd be like, is it Halloween? What's going on? Right? These young men were trying to be inconspicuous and they, of course, one of them went into the marketplace with three well, centuries old currency and centuries old dialect of language and he's trying to buy something. Obviously, it's going to make a scene. And you could Im imagine people don't understand how this person is dressed and they probably don't understand exactly how they're speaking either because language evolves. On the other side, وَوَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا قَوْمًا لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا Dhul comes across the people that barely understand anything he's saying. So there are, there's a communication gap and a mismatch between a person and their surrounding in both of these scenarios. But it's, it's different, isn't it? On the one hand, it's because of time. Because they belong to a different time and they don't fit in this time. And Dhul Qarnayn belongs to a different place. And now he's in a place where these people's language and culture is not, it's completely alien to him. I said this in the detail lectures on Dhul Qarnayn, because he's traveled all over the world, it's not hard to imagine that his army and his people that are traveling with him, because he's traveling with his legion, are multinational, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual. So for him to find a people, you know, and, and sometimes languages are like sister languages, like Spanish and Italian, right? Or Germanic languages have some relationships with each other, some connections with each other, right? So you could maybe find somebody who's close to their language and maybe they can translate some words, find some commonality. He ends up with the people he can, nobody can connect with what they're saying, almost no way to communicate with them. This is perhaps Allah's way of telling us how much of the world we don't understand. How much of it we don't understand. And just because you don't understand someone doesn't mean you can't help them. And what can separate us is to both time and space. So we can be separated from our past generations like our grandparents' generation because the world has changed in that time. So what they're able to relate to, what they connect with is very different from what we relate to and connect with. And also by place, because if you travel to different places in the world, you may have a very hard time connecting with what, what uh, yeah, the way others, other people do things. Now, uh, another contrast in between these two stories 
is that Allah Azza wa Jal gave comfort and ease and safety to the people of the cave uh, in the middle of nowhere. And by contrast, he, Allah showed us that there are people that are situated, they're, they're in their home. They didn't have to leave their home, but the danger is coming to them. Yajuj and Majuj is coming to them, right? So when Allah wants to provide you safety, then you could be in a cave. And when Allah decides that you don't have safety, then Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come to you. Right? SubhanAllah. And it's, it's remarkable that the young people, they have a cave. Anybody can walk into a cave. There's no defensive mechanism. There's no electric fence. There's no alarm system. Nothing. And they're asleep. They're defenseless. And on the other hand, you have a king who's gone all over the place. And by the way, if a king is leaving his, his, his capital, and he's traveling, definitely he's traveling with an army. And if he's going to all kinds of new places, he's, they're militarily ready for war. And he's powerful enough to implement his law because even when he went to a new place, he said, whoever does wrong will punish him. That means he has the power to enforce it. He's got a military with him. So when Dhul Qarnayn is coming, they have a defensive force. And yet, he decides that that defensive force is not the right choice. The only thing we can do is create a barrier between us and them, and they decide to build a war in, instead of engaging in war, which is going to lead me to another point that uh, is coming soon. Construction happens in both stories. Ubnu alayhim bunyanan. And I'll come back to this point of, uh, of the construction in, in, in my thematic overview. When they were discovered and they died, people wanted to commemorate their memory and build some kind of a monument. Right? So Allah says, the people that argued about them said, make a monument, a statue maybe, or you know, statues of them or something, some kind of construction. On the other hand, others said, The people who won the argument said, we're going to build a masjid over them. Masjid here doesn't mean the masjid that we think of masjid. The idea is we're going to build a sanctuary, a, a, you know, a, a place where people will come and this will be like a holy place. Um, in South Asia, a lot, of a lot of people believe in saints. So where a, a certain saint died, they'll build an entire temple type sanctuary a mazar where people will come and you know pay their homage and pray and sacrifice i don't know what and you know make all kinds of wishes and stuff this is a part of pagan culture that even made its way into muslim culture right it has nothing to do with hardin it's actually fundamentally shirk right and uh, you you could just play turn anything into a temple because you say some saint died here, or some so this this is a, an old pagan practice. So they said we should pick, make a place of prayer here. And Allah is not directly commenting, but in between the lines, what's being said here? This is the tragedy of when you miss the point. So the, the point of their legacy was something else. The point of their legacy was young people when they hold on to their faith, Allah intervenes and gives them divine help. That was their point. Their point wasn't to turn them into a temple. Or that, that wasn't the point, but this was the argument. On the other hand, Dhul Qarnayn comes across a people who are complaining about Yajuj and Majuj coming and ransacking them, Mufsiduna fil ard, and he says, give me resources, give me your manpower, give me whatever metals you have in this area, I'll put a, I'll put a barrier that's insurmountable between you and them. Aj'al baynakum wa baynahum radma. So construction is happening in both. But we're going to contrast that a little deeper in a, in a, in a minute. Um, I, I mentioned this before, but I'll elaborate now a little bit. Uh, transactions are happening in both, I said, but I, I, I was on the wrong slide then. So they said, let's take this money and go get some food, right? And on the other hand, when Dhul Qarnayn came and they were finally able to communicate, they said, whatever money we can gather, can we give it to you so you can build us a wall? Right? So payment for services, right? And in both cases, it ended up not happening. <laughs> he said, no, what Allah has given me is better. Which is a very powerful statement on his side too. If you have the resources and the ability, then you don't have to charge your poor customers, right? If you have, so this is so, in a sense, it's socially responsible. He should be paid for his services. Anybody should be paid for their services. He owes them nothing, but he realizes when he Allah has given him enough, and these people don't even have enough to build a. They don't even know how to build a wall. Then I, I have no need of their money. It doesn't add to anything that Allah has already given me. And that's certainly an attitude a doctor can develop. It's an attitude an architect can develop. It's an attitude an accountant can develop. A lawyer can develop. Pro bono work, right? 
Now, somebody who, who can't afford it, what am I going to do with their $500? I already have bigger clients. I can just, I cannot ruin their two week pay by charging them a fee. Let me just help them out, right? And that's not a bad thing. That's a Volker name type attitude, okay? Uh, I told, I, yesterday I told you that there's a gap between the two oceans and the rock between two oceans. And the, the people of the cave were in a fajwa, an open gap between the two sides of the sun passing through. And here again, he reaches in the climax of the Zulqarnain story, Hatta idha balagha bayna saddaini. He reaches a place between two mountain passes, between two large cliffs. So the idea of the, the story is always culminating or climaxing at something in between two things is a theme that carries over in all three stories. This is really interesting. Uh, the, the young people of the cave, when they were talking to each other, one of the things they said is, If they overpower you, if they cast themselves over you, meaning our people, then they will stone you to death or they will force you back into their religion. And you won't succeed in that case ever. Okay, so they're afraid of the, the others casting themselves over them. يَظْهَرُوا alaykum. And then literally this, this word occurs again in the story of Zulkarnain. He builds the wall and the, the يَعْجُوج and مَعْجُوج فَمَسْطَاعُوا أَنْ يَظْهَرُوهُ The same word, يَظْهَرُوا They were not able to overcome the barrier that was built. And what was their purpose of overcoming the barrier? To, to, be, to, to do ظُهُور against the people on the other side. So in both cases, they're afraid of oppression being lahir over them. But there are two different approaches that were taken, and we'll talk about them now. This is the time to talk about it. I said in the beginning of this talk, the Ashab al kahf flee from oppression. They're running from it. And Dhul Qardain is taking a defensive stance against oppression. By the way, there's a third option. There's fleeing. There's defense, and there's also offense. You could preemptively strike. Oh, they're coming after us, we'll go after them, right? Now the common, the most common response you expect from a king or people that are in a position of power is that you expect them to be on the offensive. You would expect that we have the resources, and he's already said, whoever does wrong, we're gonna punish him. He's already demonstrated an offensive stance earlier in the same story. But now, he's taking a defensive stance. And connecting these two stories, Allah has possibly highlighted, again, a nuanced way of seeing the world. Sometimes, the right thing to do is flee. Other times, the right thing to do is put all of your efforts in avoiding conflict, while not fleeing. That's what Dhul Qadrani is doing. He's putting all this time, energy, resources into building a wall. The entire purpose of the wall is not to end the conflict, it is to put a blockade to the conflict, to stop it from happening. A final end to the conflict will be you fight these people and you kill them. That would be the final end. But that's not the stance that he chooses. And of course, fighting is yet another, a third option. But the two not thought about options, the two not so obvious options that we don't associate with Islam sometimes, right? Because the Islamic option will just fight. But maybe there are situations in which the right thing is fleeing. And another situation in which the right thing is, you know, stopping the fitna from happening. Maybe they're thinking about collateral damage. We're in the middle of a valley. If we do engage these people in war, we don't have an open battlefield. And so if we do start losing or there are uh, attacks happening, there will be collateral damage, which will all be civilians. So maybe to save civilian lives, the only thing we can do, even though we can fight them, is to build a wall. So other things have to be taken into uh, to consideration. And being, being strong in your faith does not mean that you're idealistic and unrealistic. And perhaps that's what's being taught to us from these two contrasts. Uh, the insha'Allah theme that started in Surah Al-Kahf continues. So in, 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 Ashab, in Ashab Al-Kahf, at the end, Allah told the Prophet Wasallam. Don't you dare say about anything that you're going to do. I'm going to do this and this tomorrow for sure. Except that you say that Allah wills. You add Allah's will to your future plans. So this is a, an imperative on the Muslims. This is why when we talk about the future, we say, inshallah, right? In the story of, of Musa, yesterday we saw in the beginning, he didn't say inshallah. 
He said, I'm going to keep going until I find this place. And he didn't find it. And then he learned his lesson. So when his teacher came and said, you're not going to be able to have sabr with me, he said, Satajiduni, insha'Allah sabiran. Now he added insha'Allah. So there's a re, there was an echoing of the mention in, from the first story. But now we take another step. In this story, he builds a wall. And he's able to build a wall. And once he's able to build a wall, he realizes that, you know, it's not just about, oh, I'm going to do this and this tomorrow, and I have to add inshallah. But actually, in his own words, without saying inshallah, he said something. He said, even though I've built this, this will only stand here so long as Allah wants it to. When Allah's promise comes, this will collapse, it'll be nothing. It'll fall apart. As solid as this wall is, as powerful as it is, that the enemy can't scale it, they can't drill through it, a time will come when this will be nothing. You could, you could be so proud of yourself of how impregnable you made this wall, and now nothing can break it, this is forever. But he's actually realistic about the meaning of insha'Allah. This stands so long as Allah wills. And Allah's promise is coming, even if it stands throughout the, this life. And uh, the akhirah comes when the akhirah is going to fall apart anyway. But whatever Allah's promise is for this wall is going to get fulfilled. Just like Allah's promised time is for every one of us to go. And for every one of the things that we have to go. Our health has a time limit. You know, Our wealth has a time limit. Our age, our life on this earth has a time limit. The things we own have a time limit. How long will we get to keep something or hold on to something is not up to us. That's part of فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي جَعَلَهُ دَكَّا وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي حَقَّا uh, It's interesting also that it was a really interesting contrast the Ashab al-Kahf were terrified they were terrified and they were terrifying to anybody who showed up at the cave so Allah made it look like if you were to go there وَتَحْسَبُهُمْ أَيْقَاضًا وَهُمْ رُقُودٌ you would think that they're awake while they're sleeping. We keep tossing them to the right and the left. And their dog has got its paws stretched out. Sleeping, the dog's got its paws stretched out. But a dog with its paws stretched out could also be a dog in the attack position. You know, growling. Were you to stumble upon them, you would run from them. You would turn your back and turn others back, running from them, fleeing. And you would be filled with terror from them. You would never even, just even the mention of them would terrify you. This is how Allah defended them, by perception. Right? So when Allah wants, anybody will be afraid of something that is not scary at all. He can make you defenseless and yet terrifying. And when Allah wants, you have someone like Dhul Qarnayn, which is a powerful ruler, who Allah has given all kind of resources and victory wherever he goes, and yet the enemy is unafraid of him. They're itching to scale over the wall and fight with him, right? Even though when they see a wall, they must have recognized this was not built by some nobody. Whoever this is, is pretty, pretty powerful and pretty able. So they'll probably make short work of us even if we cross this wall. And yet they don't care. When Allah decides, He puts fear in the enemy. And when Allah decides, He allows the enemy to be fearless. Again, a nuanced view of you know, uh, the believer and how, what kind of antagonism they have to face. They may have, they may have to face someone who is terrified of them. Or they may face someone who is absolutely no regard for consequences. They are completely fearless, like the Yajurism Ajurism. They can't wait to go and engage in a fight. It's also counterintuitive, isn't it? The defenseless ones are terrifying and the one that has defenses uh, is not being feared. Right? So it's kind of, it's flipped. Uh, this was the point I was making uh, before about construction. We're towards the end now. A religious monument is missing the point. What I'm referring to is they said we should build a temple here, a masjid here, a place of worship here to commemorate Ashab al kahf which again misses the point of what Allah had them discovered for. But you know, we think of uh, these places, these religious sanctuaries, the, the world thinks of them as places to remember something holy, something sacred. But sacred is not decided by people. Sacred is decided by Allah. I don't decide that something is holy or something is sacred. That comes from Allah. 
And now you have, on the flip side, you have a, a no-name mountain pass that is inhabited by no-name people. And Dhul-Qarnayn is going to build a wall. And this wall from Allah is in, in fact a kind of sacred thing. It's a service. And so he said, Hada rahmatun min Rabbi. This is a rahmah from my Rabb. And this construction has nothing to do with worship. It has nothing to do with, it's not a holy site. Its only purpose is to help people. Our view of everything in the world transforms. Our view of what is sacred transforms because of this. What is sacred isn't just a space. What is sacred is what helps others, what protects others. Somebody opens up a, a, you know, a, a, a mazar, a masjid, even if they open up a masjid, and they are manipulating people from that place. It can happen. That can happen. Religious manipulation in the name of God. Right? And somebody else opens up a clinic in a village. And the clinic may be sacred in the sight of Allah. Because of what it's doing. It's helping people. It's preventing a problem. Broadening our perspective on what is and isn't a rahmah from Allah. That's what's happening here. And of course, somebody, you know, because we have this selective dissonance, oh, are you saying we shouldn't build masjid? <sighs> no, I'm saying you should build masjids for the right reason. And maybe we should take inspiration from the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, who built the masjid where people were constantly being helped. People were being helped. The door were, doors were always open. Non-Muslims were walking in. Christian missionaries were staying as guests. People that didn't have anything to eat were going where? To the masjid. People that were having trouble in their home were going where? In the masjid. People that wanted to learn something were going to the masjid. People that needed protection were going to the masjid. The masjid was the halfway house. The masjid was the counseling center. The masjid was the soup kitchen. The masjid was all those things. And maybe that's what made it sacred. That is what made it sacred. Not just the prayer. You see? So, yes, I am saying build masjids. But let's make masjids inspired by Rasulullah Let's make masjids inspired by what was going on in the masjid that is supposed to be. Look at what Ibrahim salam prays for. He's building Allah's house and he wants people to have safety and provision. If we establish a masjid somewhere, Muslims, then that masjid should also be, the surroundings of it, because of the Muslim presence, should now be a place where people find more rizq and they find more safety. Because we're people of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Anyway, I think this is the last one. Yeah. Um, so this one is um, a little bit philosophical, but an important one. So in the study of the Quran, especially nowadays, in you know, in, the, in modern studies in the Quran and Western studies in the Quran, one big topic that is um, very much under discussion is historicity. And historicity is how verifiable are the stories in the Quran? Are they borrowed from somewhere else? Where they? What is their origin? Where do they come from? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And the historicity challenge in the study of the Quran, the biggest challenge of all of them, is in fact Surah Al-Kahf. And two of the biggest ones are Musa and Khadr's story and Dhul Qarnayn's story. Who is Dhul Qarnayn? What century is this? Where is this place between the mountain passes? Where is the east and where is the west? Who is this group that can't cover themselves? Who is Ya'juj and Ma'juj? These are important historical questions that people are asking, trying to figure out what the Quran is talking about. And all kinds of theories have been postulated. In our series, we actually discuss some of these theories and academic works that have been done in more recent times on the subject. But let's take a step back from all of that discussion and come back to the Quran. Allah could have told us the exact geographical location, yes or no? Allah could have told us how many people were in the cave. Where the cave is located, he could have told us. He could have told us every bit of detail that we're so curious about, but he chose deliberately not. He ignored the historical questions that people are most curious about in the story of the cave. You know, uh, my wife told me there's actually in some countries, Muslim countries, they have the names of the seven sleepers. Of the, they, they consider them seven. Quran doesn't say they're seven. 
but famously they call them the seven sleepers of the cave, and they have their names, and they have their, they memorize their names, and they want a dua answered, they say their names, and then they make a dua. <laughs> you might as well just memorize Marvel action hero characters. I don't I don't know what where you get this idea from. But the, the point that I'm making is people want to fill the historical gaps with something. And when you see what we have done with the missing historical information, you realize why Allah doesn't tell us this stuff to begin with. You realize why. So he ignored them. And in Dhul Qabnain's story, he goes where the sun sets. He goes where the sun rises. He goes between two mountains. Is that specific geo-tracking? It's so ambiguous. He meets a people. He meets another people. Yeah, Juj and Majuj are causing trouble. Who are Yajuj and Majuj? Where are they? What, what, what's going on here? Allah will deliberately ignore what we think are historical, important historical questions because the Quran reclaims the story and then says, I want your focus on what you can learn from the story, not the dates, facts, and figures of the story. He's deliberately making that a moot point. He's deliberately testing us with that. And he tested us with that in Ashab al Kahf story, which is why when people say they were seven, eight, nine, whatever, he says, Qurrabi a'lamu bi iddatihim. Tell them your master knows better what their number was. It's as if Allah is saying, yeah, and I'm not going to tell you. Keep arguing about pointless things. But if you found out they were six, you're like, ah, I was right. <laughs> yes. Now I can sleep better. What are you going to get? If you somehow discovered there were nine of them, and the tenth one was the dog. How is that going to change you? If you discovered the, the wall between these two mountain passes was in Oklahoma, how does that change your life? And if it does change your life, you got a problem. Because if you, if you discover it's in Oklahoma, we should go there and touch it and then make dua. <laughs> That's exactly why you're not being told these things. This is the mindset that is being crushed by the Quran. This is what's being broke. We're be being broken free from it, from you know, uh, uh, tur turning the religion into religious artifacts, sacred sites, you know, symbols, and we hold on to those symbols. That is the way of other religions. That is the way of other. Our, our deen came to free us from this. It's a profoundly liberating religion, a free thinking religion, a critical thinking religion. It's like no other deen. There's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like. No other sacred book keeps making a demand. Why don't you think? Don't you then think? Don't they then ponder? Go travel in the land and see how creation began. Learn history. What book will tell you that? What religious book will tell you that? What religious book will tell you? fiha. He put you on the earth and he wanted you to develop and enhance it. He wanted you, all, he wanted all of you to be developed on it. That's our book. That's this Quran. And so the part of my reason for, you know, uh, sharing these these uh, contrasts and comparisons of these stories, one obviously is to highlight how interconnected the stories are, and how beautifully we can learn something from those comparisons, and contrasts, and how a surah's point converges when you understand its literary structure, when the opening and closing stories are being connected. So my next task, inshallah, is going to be I'm going to be comparing the two stories that are side by side. So Musa's story, Musa and Khadr's story, and Dhul Qarnayn's story. That's what I'm going to try and do tomorrow, inshallah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikil hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.